we always go to my in-laws house. And I was so worried about how I was going to handle it with my new hearing aids and like, how was I going to be a part of everything? And so many people get stressed out about that. So we try and have rules. Rules are hard when you have people of different generations. But what I always do is I arrange the seating. And so I am in charge of where everybody sits. And so I make sure that I put the people that are easiest for me to hear on the sides of me and the people that are hardest for me to hear across from me so I can get the visual cues from speech reading as well. And I'm in charge of the soundscape. So like what music is playing, where, and when it's not. And so it's just the things that I control and they allow me to do that. And they sit wherever the heck I tell them to do. And sometimes when you're having a big Thanksgiving and you're inviting people outside of the family as well, and they have their own needs, we have to be a little bit flexible, but I feel very supported when um, they say, just tell us where, what you need so that we can have the best situation. And not everyone has uh, that in their family, unfortunately. So I feel very lucky for that. Welcome to the Hearing Wellness Journey Podcast, an exploration of determination, hope, self-discovery, and triumph. We'll share the personal experiences of those that are living with hearing loss and provide a haven for their stories to show others that they are not alone in this journey. Please welcome your hosts, Dr. Dawn Hyman and Lindsay Doherty. Hello and welcome. I'm so excited that you're here. Today's Hearing Wellness Journey podcast has a very special guest. Her name is Sherry Eberts, and she's going to tell us her story of her hearing loss journey. She also is an author of a book that is called Here and Beyond, and hopefully she'll talk about that with us today. But without further ado, Sherry, welcome and thank you for coming on today's podcast. Thank you, Dawn, for having me. It's so much fun. Absolutely. Can you tell us a little bit about your story? Where did you grow up? So I grew up in a small town in New Jersey called Flanders, New Jersey, which no one has ever heard of, but it's near Morristown, which sometimes people have heard that, heard of that. And it was a, a beautiful little town, just a very typical suburb. My father commuted into the city and into New York City, and my mom was a teacher, and my sister and I went to the public school there. Nice. And do you, you have just one sibling? Yeah, a younger sister. Excellent. And were your grandparents around? Did you have a tight-knit family, a large family, small? My grandparents were both in Delaware. So my parents were high school sweethearts and they met and I guess they moved a little bit away from where they grew up. So to New Jersey from Delaware, but we did go visit my grandparents pretty often, which was wonderful. And we had a, a close knit family, although my father had hearing loss and struggled very much with the stigma of hearing loss. And it really did have an impact on the family dynamic over time as he started to isolate himself because of the embarrassment and the stigma that he placed on himself about his hearing loss. So it was definitely a, dis a disruptive part of my childhood growing up from the struggles that he had. Wow. So how old was your father when he first noticed a change in his hearing or was he born with hearing loss? Yeah, so we both have genetic hearing loss, although we've never been able to get a real diagnosis. And the first time I noticed it was in my mid twenties. And when I discussed it with him, he said it was around the same time. His mother also had that as an adult onset with hearing loss. So it's definitely something that's been passed down um, across the, the generations. But I remember him wearing one hearing aid for a period of time and then two hearing aids. And I was a, a pretty young kid, but I could see right off the bat just how much it impacted his confidence and his ability to engage with the family and socially with other people. He was, this was, this was a long time ago, and he just felt that it represented such a weakness in himself that he went out of his way to hide it 
from everyone. So he had his hair grown down, long sideburns over his ears to hide the hearing aids. And more and more, we'd find him off in the corner at family gatherings and trying to just, I guess he probably couldn't hear in the loud space with all the people talking or any kind of an event. And he just isolated himself. And I remember one time as a child, I went over to him and said, why are you sitting all by yourself? We're at this family gathering. And he said, oh, if someone wants to talk to me, they know where to find me. And as a child, I just, I don't know, I just probably skipped off in the other direction. I didn't really know what to do with that. But now that I have hearing loss myself, I, I understand. He probably was having so much trouble hearing in this loud space with all the festivities and he just needed a break or maybe he'd just given up trying. And because he was so stigmatized, he probably was also worried that people might realize he was having trouble hearing them in that type of situation. And so he really isolated himself. And so it, it's thinking back on it just makes me very sad because he wasn't really able to ask us for help and wasn't really able to move past that in his life in terms of being stigmatized by his hearing loss. That's so sad. And it, it's, it sounds like a little bit of learned helplessness where he was just like in a defeatist position going, well, why bother? I'm, what's the point? I'm not even going to try anymore. Yeah, I think it was that. And I think it was also pride. Like, I think that it just was not how he wanted to express himself. He didn't want to be in a position where he was showing any weakness or that he would require. And that definitely had a huge impact on the way I thought about hearing loss. When I developed it in my mid-20s, I was horrified. I said, oh my God, this is the worst thing that can happen. Look at what happened to my father. Look at how much he separated himself from everyone. And I just was worried and really terrified that was going to be my story. And luckily I've been able to walk uh, a different path, learning, learning from the mistakes that, that he had made. So what happened? You were in your twenties. Were you um, still in school or were you working? I was in graduate school, so I was in business school, and it was pretty quickly into the first semester. It was this big case study method type of type of learning situation. So we were in a big auditorium with lots of people, and pretty quickly I realized that I was not hearing some of the conversation in the classroom. Maybe it was something like someone made a joke under their breath or, or something, and a lot of times everyone in the classroom would just burst out laughing and I'd be looking around trying to figure out what was happening. And I knew what it was. In the back of my mind, I knew, I guess I must be losing my hearing. And I had really been hoping that it would skip my generation. So my father had hearing loss, but his sister had typical hearing. And the same thing with his mother. Her sister had typical hearing. So it almost felt, and my sister actually has pretty typical hearing. So it, it seems like it strikes once a generation, which I don't know if that makes sense genetically or not. But I went to get my hearing tested and they said, mild hearing loss. There's really nothing you can do about it at this point. They didn't um, make any suggestions. They didn't recommend hearing aids. They didn't recommend maybe a, a different seat in the classroom would be helpful. I really felt like I walked in with no answers and walked out with no answers. So I just hit it and just faked it for many years as a lot of people do with hearing loss. And one of the things we talk about in Here and Beyond our book is this hearing loss journey. And Everyone has their own story, but we do often pass through these same steps, these same phases of hearing loss. And one of them is the longest, which is that debating with yourself. Do I have a hearing loss? Do I acknowledge my hearing loss? What is this and how do I want to handle this in my life before taking the, the next step in terms of actually testing and seeing if you do have the hearing loss or not? How frustrating for you. You came to a professional, you said, I have a problem and they had no solutions for you. So it enabled you to stay in that first step for too long, or you felt trapped there. It sounds like because you wanted intervention, you wanted help. And for some reason, the, the place or person you went to did not offer that. And I apologize 
That's not right. <laughs> your fault. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's very frustrating. And it's one of the things that I write about a lot in terms of person-centered care, because I think that we can only learn from our experiences. And I feel like if I had gone to a different type of practitioner earlier in my hearing loss journey, think maybe things would have started a little bit differently. Now, I was also dealing with all of this stigma and all this baggage from my father, right? So this is what I thought people did when they had hearing loss. I thought that you hid it and that you were embarrassed and ashamed and you faked it. And all of those things are really not the right things to be doing when you have hearing loss. It's much better to treat it. It's much better to acknowledge it, to accept it, to tell people about it. That way you can ask for the assistance that you need. But none of these things were in my mind at the time. It was more about just blocking and tackling and hiding, following in his footsteps. And that first audiologist allowed me to do that for many more years just sending me back out to fend for myself. Wow. Yep, definitely. We all have learned behaviors, not the best traits that we get from some parents, or they just, they don't know what they don't know, or they don't realize they're teaching us something. And the big goal of this podcast, my big mission in life is to try to eliminate the negative stigma around hearing loss. Honest to goodness. And this just eats me up. And, but it's, Obviously, there's a mission for a reason because it is happening over and over again. Brene Brown talks about being wholehearted, being the happiest people are not ashamed of where they came from. They're not ashamed of who they are and they admit their shortcomings. And as a really nice side effect, it actually attracts more people when you're open and honest. But your dad had some valid reasons if the hearing devices weren't working well or there wasn't a lot of awareness about hearing loss. Your book didn't exist. Tips and tricks on what to do did not exist. So he was doing the best he could. So tell me, how did, what happened like how did you overcome all of this and become the person that you are with this mindset of helping others and saying, it doesn't have to be this way? It was a long journey, right? So it really started with this denial and then I hid it for a long time, but eventually I was in the workplace and I really did need hearing aids. So I went to get another pair of hearing aids and I started to wear them and I used them occasionally. When I really needed them, I would sneak them in. But things went along for many years until I had children. And I saw them watching me do the same things that I had watched my father do. I was hiding my hearing loss. I was laughing at jokes I hadn't heard. And because it's a genetic hearing loss, I don't know if I've passed it on to them. They're not in their early adulthood yet, although they're getting close. And I wanted to set a better example. I just know those stories of passing down these cycles of learned behaviors and stigma, and I just didn't want to do it. So I made a choice. I decided that I was going to accept my hearing loss and I was going to start telling people about it. And I just did. I just made that change. And I started volunteering at other hearing loss nonprofits. And it was the first time that I had come in contact with anyone else that had hearing loss, other than my father, of course. But I saw in front of me all these role models and all these people who were doing these terrific things in their lives. They were composers, they were musicians, they were writers, they were business people. There were audiologists, there were all these different people living successful lives. And I was just so inspired to see that. And it made me feel more worthy. It made me feel okay in my own skin because I saw that this wasn't something to be embarrassed about. It wasn't something that I had to hide from other people. And so it was just such a blessing and such a relief, frankly. It's so much easier to just be who you are rather than trying to sneak around. And it just, it's so much less exhausting <laughs> and it takes the pressure off. And so it was really my children who started me down that path and then meeting other people with hearing loss that has continued me on that path. And one of the things that I really realized is that when we advocate for ourselves, we are advocating for other people with hearing loss too. And it really came to be 
over time, this project and this passion that I want to make things better for people with hearing loss. I want to get rid of that stigma. So nobody has to go through that struggle that I had. And I wanted to take the learnings that I have come up with over all these years of living not so well with hearing loss and then better with hearing loss. And that's what Gail, Hannon, and I really try and do in this book is to share sort of the knowledge that we have gathered through our many years of living with hearing loss and put it together in a, in a bit of a formula. Well, it's not like a formula, like check, but a roadmap, a way that everyone can learn to live skillfully with hearing loss. That's amazing. Did you, when you first went to one of these meetings or you met someone, did you sit quietly and just observe and watch or did you just full on want to become friends with everyone? What happened? That's a great question. The first time I went, I hid in the corner because I was like, okay, these people have hearing loss. Maybe I can't hear very well, but I'm not a person with hearing loss. That makes no sense. It was, I hadn't yet gotten over that hump where I could say I belong in this group of people. And it took, it was, I went to an HLAA convention and I hid in the corner <laughs> for a little bit. And then someone found me and they were like, oh, hi. And they brought me out of, of my shell. And it, it's not like you're going to snap your fingers and everything's going to be better, but it did show me just because of all these people that I saw that there are many ways forward and people can live well with their hearing loss. And so I love what you're doing with this podcast too, which is to reach out to people who might be feeling less confident or comfortable, maybe just new to their own hearing loss. Maybe they're still sitting in the corner hiding like I was. Maybe they're waiting for that person to come and reach out to them and say, you, you've got this, you can do this. So I think it's wonderful what you're doing because it just takes that one connection to really change somebody's life. Isn't that the truth? Like I think with everything, it's that one teacher, or that one person that made a comment that makes you see yourself in a different light. So now you bring up a really good point. You hadn't identified yourself yet with someone being someone who has a hearing loss, but those people did. And let's be honest. Okay. I'm wearing contact lenses. And so I wear glasses, but I don't identify myself as someone with a vision problem. Does that seem weird? No, I, but I get it. Yeah. Right. Okay. So I could see where you were going to this meeting and you're like, okay, am I, were you wondering, okay, let me ask this. Let me not assume. Did you have enough hearing loss to belong there? Did that cross your mind? Absolutely. I saw at this convention, there were people with all different degrees of hearing loss, but um, people, some people were signing. Sign language was something that was just not a part of my life and still is really not a part of my life. But I just didn't know how did I fit in? And did I want to put that label, that name on myself? Did I want to identify as somebody who had a hearing loss. And I think it was just still a little bit of my father's voice in the back of my head. And maybe it's just the societal stigma, right? And he didn't create this. He learned it from somewhere that people with hearing loss still today are treated as the brunt of the joke sometimes in the mainstream media. And I find it infuriating. And it, it just, I think it's just that whisper that you put into the back of your own mind. And we all have to learn how to turn some of those negative attitudes that we have about hearing loss into more positive, actionable statements. And that is the whole section of the book, actually, that we talk about a mind shift. And it's, we take in the book, we take an attitude selfie about our hearing loss. And we look at a number of the most common negative attitudes that people might have about their hearing loss. Why me? Or I want to hear the way I used to. And we acknowledge that those are things that are okay to feel, but it's more productive if we can think about it in an action oriented, productive way. And for example, we say that you can take the attitude of why me and turn it into something like, I have the potential to change my journey. The person with the most power in my hearing loss success is me. 
And that just turns it on its head and puts, gives the power back to you to take steps um, and to live better with your hearing loss. So a lot of it is this attitude change. It's a very important part of living skillfully. Absolutely. I feel like if you can name something, if you identify with it, if you say, okay, this is me, you're more likely to have confidence to work with that. So here's an aside, silly analogy. I have a lot of them. So I'm a veg growing up. My dad, it's funny how our parents definitely shape us. So my dad had a massive heart attack at the age of 28. I was three years old. I remember waking up and the police, the paramedics, everyone was there and they were taking him out on a gurney quadruple bypass surgery at the age of 28. So I grew up my entire life worried that I was going to have a heart attack, that my father would die at any moment. And so he didn't drive a car, he rode his bike to work and we didn't eat chocolate. We had during the holidays and all this healthy stuff. And so I knew that it was good for me to, cause I have the same blood disorder as him. I know that it's good for me to not have high cholesterol in my diet. And it's probably best if I was a vegetarian. Also, I found that the way that my, no offense to my mom if she's listening, but she didn't cook very well. And mainly because my dad was told in the eighties, no salt, no seasoning, every, no butter, nothing. Everything was bland, boiled, terrible or as in New Jersey, you'd say horrible. When I finally found that I was training for a triathlon and I found that I was avoiding meat because I didn't like it. It had never been prepared well. And I was just eating vegetables. I wasn't getting the nutrients that I needed because I didn't, it was, wasn't until the moment I said, you know what, I'm going, I'm declaring it. I'm a vegetarian and I'm going to find out what I need for me to live the best life possible and to have the nutrients I need and to follow the proper diet so that I can get the energy that I need. And it changed my life to announce to my family, I'm a vegetarian. And if you make jokes about it, I really don't care. Don't, I don't really care. But initially I did. It would hurt me when they would say things about, wow, you're not eating this hot dog. What do you think you're better than us? It's, come on. But knowing and taking the steps of, okay, I need this many grams of protein in my diet. I need to do this. I need to do this. And this is what's best for me. Paradigm shift, completely different. I'm a healthier person. I'm happier than being a closet, pushing the meat aside, and then depriving myself of what I actually need. And I don't know if that analogy works, but I can see how with you, when you finally said, look, this is going to be good for me. This is what I would like to do. And I'm going to seek out resources to help me. You're so much happier. hundred percent. No, I think that analogy is a great analogy. And we all have that thing that we need to do that maybe we're hiding because we feel like other people won't understand that part of us. And when we can just acknowledge our whole self we're just freer and we're happier. And then we are able to take the steps that we need to take uh, in order to live well. And that's why one of the first things that we really recommend in the book is to self-identify yeah. and to let people know about your hearing loss because it's invisible. People might not see your hearing aids. They might not see your cochlear implants. And even if they do, they might not know really what that means. They might think it's like glasses where you put on glasses and or contacts and you can see pretty well. I function like a, a person with typical vision. And in fact, I function incredibly well because everything just sharpens. Now with my hearing aids, hearing aids don't work like that. There are other things that you need to do in order to communicate well. And that's another thing in the book that we really try and have people switch the focus from hearing well to communicating well, because I will probably never hear well. I'll hear better with my devices for sure, but I will never have great hearing, especially in difficult situations, but I can have great communication because I will use other skills and other attitudes to help me along that path. So I really 
resonate with what you were saying in terms of the, of the vegetarian story. And now you're free and you're out there and you can ask people to help you if you need that. If you're going to a restaurant, you can ask them what is available for me here. I can go to a restaurant and ask them to try and find me a seat that works best for me. So it's really all about understanding your own needs and then being confident enough to ask for them because we all deserve to have our needs met no matter what they are. It's true. We all deserve the best. And the more people know, the better off things are. If you can self-advocate, definitely a great thing. One of the, the my favorite parts of, in general about this book is the way that you and Gail both use stories to give examples of, so this is what happened and it wasn't great, but here's what I did and here's why I recommend this. And you're truly sharing a lot about yourselves and any shortcomings and you, you make light of some things and then some of it's more serious, but you really humanize it for all of us. It's very well written. Thank you. I appreciate that. That was really one of the goals is we wanted people to feel like we were on the journey with them because we are, right? We have learned this wonderful way to live skillfully, but that doesn't mean we're perfect. And it doesn't mean every day is perfect because that's not what hearing loss is. It's a journey. There are ups and there are downs and we give everyone permission to have those and still know that overall they're doing very well and living skillfully with their hearing loss. Yeah. I love that. Can you tell us a little bit about, so did your hearing just, when it changed, did it continue to progress or did it stay at that level? So it's still continuing to progress. So it started off as mild hearing loss and I have a very strange, well, I'm told it's a strange audiogram. So I have almost perfect high pitch hearing. And so it's not exactly a cookie bite, although it's become a little bit more of a cookie bite over time, but my weakest frequencies are those mid-range speech frequencies. And so I think that it's lucky for me in a way because the high pitches have so much important information in terms of word endings and that type of thing. So that really helps me with my word discrimination. But when I look at my father's audiogram over time, it's similar in terms of the lower and the middle frequencies, but his high frequencies when he, when he passed in his sixties were actually quite profound. I'm worried looking down the road, at how things will progress, but we, I have no control over it. And so I can only just continue to, I get my hearing tested every year just to make sure that I'm monitoring and, and staying current and making sure that I have my devices programmed as best as I can. And I just try and stay on top of any new technologies. And it's just a continual process. And I feel that I've developed some of these skills that as things continue to progress, I'm assuming I'll just have to learn how to up my skills and up my communication. I believe that. I think just keeping a positive attitude and being ready for, let's be honest, we're in a world of change right now. Technology is constantly changing. Can you share with us your favorite technology or the favorite um, new thing that has come about that you're like, wow, 10 years ago, this wasn't a thing. <laughs> captioning, automatic captioning, I think is such a life changer. Now, CART was around 10 years ago, but CART and CART is wonderful but it's expensive. And if you're going to have a meeting on the fly, it's really hard to get a cart operator to, to be part of that. So the idea that, especially during the pandemic, that we can have captioning on Zoom or on Google Meet at the ready, it just opens up a whole opportunity set for people. Now it's not perfect, right? The accuracy is not perfect. So if you're in a medical situation or something where accuracy is paramount, you're going to need more than the automatic captions. But 
if you're in just a general situation and everyone can see them, and if something's typed incorrectly, you can say, no, I didn't mean to butter your bread. I meant to put your head down or something. But if you can see it and you can correct it real time, that's wonderful. So I love captions. I wish they were everywhere, universally, in public places, online. And I feel like we are slowly but surely moving in that direction. I think that I talk to my, my teenagers, they love the captions. People consume media online with captions, whether they have hearing loss or not. So hopefully we will all benefit from that and we'll just move in that direction. Yeah, it's so nice to some, sometimes, especially the younger kids are watching different videos, even on YouTube. And when you don't have the volume on the captions there, so you can read what's being said and not have to have the volume on, which is very nice. I do feel like I've always thought that the, the captioning should be more available, more accessible, especially easily. They could do it in the movie theaters more easily than they are and they don't some movie theaters maybe will have tuesday nights that they have captioned movies but they could easily do it all the time or i'm i know that the technology is coming but could they come a little faster I, even the remember the google glasses that were available for a short period of time that some people got to try if they could give Google glasses in the movie theater where the words came up for that specific person. How great would that be? I would love that. And imagine if they were your own glasses. So you didn't have to go stand in line. You didn't have to leave your license behind. You didn't have to go stand in line again. Yeah. And that would be incredible. And it has to be doable, right? It's just about turning it on and have, making that product readily available for people. So hopefully someone in the movie theater industry or Google are listening. There is a need and we all would like it because, so let's go back to, does someone identify as someone who has hearing loss or is they someone who happens to have a hard time understanding what's being said? And we'll call that denial. So many people are like, no, I don't have a hearing loss. I just have a hard time understanding what people are saying. I'm like, okay. And they're not ready. They're in stage one still, a little bit of denial for the hearing loss. But it would help some people to be able to understand what's happening. A lot of people, they don't want to use closed captioning on the TV because they think it would take away from watching the movie. And I turn on closed captioning. I think it enhances. Right. I agree. And I think during the pandemic, more people started doing that, especially people started watching, what was it, the Squid Games? I, I think that might not be the right name, but there were okay. there was content that was coming from other countries in other languages. And so people were watching content with the captioning because it was subtitles and they just leave them on. Yeah, I think it, there's so much research that actually shows that people remember things better when they see the captions, they enjoy it, it's less taxing on the brain. So there's just so many positives. So hopefully someone is listening and it will continue to be more and more ubiquitous. Do you tend to have a particular app on your phone that you use if you were at a restaurant and you're trying to understand someone talking? Yeah, I, I'd like otter.ai. It's a speech to text app. The thing is though, that in a loud restaurant, the speech to text apps are going to struggle, right? That's so it, it, I almost find sometimes that where I'm struggling, the speech to text apps are also struggling because they, they're using maybe some of the same technology my hearing aids are to try and get the voice sounds from all of that background noise. But I do find that, that one is very helpful. And then if you have an Android phone, Live Transcribe is also very good. Yeah, that's another thing I think that they could improve and help with because some of the phones enable you to turn on the start live listen and let someone talk in your cell phone direct to the hearing aids. The problem is you just hand it over your phone where the closed captioning could be. So could a remote mic connect only to the Otter AI so then you could look and hear better and someone just happens to have it clipped to their shirt? I'll have to ask. Tina Childress, if you're listening, is that possible? Because I think it needs to be, if not, and we'll have to work on that. That's a Tina's great idea. 
Do you, you know Tina Childress, right? She's fabulous. She is definitely a technology guru. <laughs> yeah, but that's, I don't know. So I ask these things because I'm sure other people are thinking about this too. Look at that. The, the app could work, but it doesn't work great in background noise, but that's where it's needed. There's just, there, it's not perfect yet. It's getting there. The technology is so much better, but a lot of it has to do with strategy. Are you going to call ahead and get the better table? Do you ask uh, to not be next to that Bose speaker that's pumping in the music for the whole back deck? Could you be someplace else? Getting up and changing seats because the conversation changed and sit next to the person that you're sitting with. Having people that understand what you're going through or are sympathetic, even if they're not empathetic, if they, they care enough to say, you know what, I'll do whatever you need me to do. Let's do it. I want you to hear. I want you to be a part of this conversation. And I think something that's so important for us as people with hearing loss is to not just say, I'm having trouble hearing you. It's giving them specific instructions about what to do. So there's this story that I tell in the book actually about my family and I went on a hike. And it's all about not just saying, I need help. It's saying, what do I need to do? So we're on this beautiful hike. And usually we try and line up in a way so that I'm in the front. So at least like their voices are heading in my general direction for me to hear them on the hike. But somehow I ended up in the back and I'm calling out to them. I'm in the back. I can't hear. And no one's saying anything. And I'm like, I can't hear you if I'm in the back. And they're like, okay. And then we got to this sort of clearing and we stopped to look out at the view. And I said, I need to be in the second position so that I can hear while we're walking. And all of a sudden they moved out of the way and I was able to take the spot and we continued on. And I said, why didn't we just do this? And my son said to me, mom, you didn't use your words, <laughs> which you know how kids like throw things back in your face. Yeah. So I was like, I did use my words. And he said, no, you didn't use your words. And I thought about it and he was right. All I was saying is this isn't working. I wasn't saying I need to be here so that we can all communicate better as a family. And once I did that, it was like the, the Red Sea parted and everything was fine. So I think it's just a good example of not, even if people are want to help, you need to help them help you. You need to be able to articulate specifically what you want them to do in order to help. So I just love that story because it shows that the words that you use as you're trying to communicate can have very different outcomes. Absolutely. And the tone you use, or even the, the way that your family communicates with you, excuse me, dear, do you have a moment cueing them that I have something important to say rather than how many family members just come up to you and just start talking and you're reading something and you're going, what? And it's not that you didn't hear them. You had no idea they were going to say something right. and giving it, it works both ways. Communication is a two way street, but them saying, Hey, do you mind? I, I want to talk. And that respect and the way that it said is helpful. Your son sounds adorable. And yes. we say that in our house too. You didn't use your words. How old was he when he said that? He was probably 14 or 15. Oh. <laughs> so he was like, Mom, you didn't use your words. Like he was kind of throwing it back at me, but I respect that. So that was great. It's true. The kids, they do say the darndest things, even for children, adults, grandparents, you name it. If we communicate well, if we try to help to make sure that we say what we need and then they receive knowing what, what is needed, it's just so much easier. Do you find that you have certain rules in your house about when you have family over and there's going to be a lot of food and cooking and whatever? How do, is the family dynamics? Is there one person that's allowed to speak at a time? Do you move everyone out of the kitchen? What happens at Thanksgiving in, in the Ebert household? <laughs> That is a great question. And actually, that was the first blog post I ever wrote for my blog, livingwithhearingloss.com, was about Thanksgiving. Because we have these big, loud, fun Thanksgivings. We always go to my in-law's house. And I was so worried about how I was going to handle it with my new hearing aids. And like, how was I going to 
be a part of everything. And so many people get stressed out about that. So we try and have rules. Rules are hard when you have people of different generations. But what I always do is I arrange the seating. And so I am in charge of where everybody sits. And so I make sure that I put the people that are easiest for me to hear on the sides of me and the people that are hardest for me to hear across from me so I can get the visual cues from speech reading as well. And I'm in charge of the soundscape. So like what music is playing, where, and when it's not. And so it's just the things that I control and they allow me to do that. And they sit wherever the heck I tell them to do. And sometimes when you're having a big Thanksgiving and you're inviting people outside of the family as well, and they have their own needs, we have to be a little bit flexible, but I feel very supported when um, they say, just tell us where, what you need so that we can have the best situation. And not everyone has uh, that in their family, unfortunately. So I feel very lucky for that. That sounds amazing. I'm so happy that they let you. So you're, do you have note cards or you have the seating <laughs> little, little things? What do they look like? Are they turkeys, pewter? Are they, they my kids, actually the, all the cousins made them. This is like many years ago at this point. So they're like written in like kids, little penmanship and little oh. turkey stickers. And we just keep them from year to year and put them out. <laughs> I love that. It's definitely a thing in your family. That is fantastic. And I hope that everybody who's listening creates a seating uh, arrangement, who's in charge. If you are the mother of a child with hearing loss or you're the daughter of the family member who is maybe older than you and you're in charge of the seating, have that person help create that seating arrangement because it empowers them to have more control and know that it's going to be great. Like they're going to have a better time at that dinner table rather than trailing off and sitting in the living room by themselves and saying, why Bob? And it still might not be perfect. So it's important to have these realistic expectations, but enjoy talking to the people that are around you. And then after the dinner, go seek out the other people and maybe take them to a quiet spot or maybe get the heck out of the loud environment and take a walk around the block or around the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So it's also about pacing yourself and, and it's okay if we can't hear every single thing. And you know what? Not everyone at that table is hearing every single thing anyway. We just have these expectations we place on ourselves. And I think we need to be a little bit kinder to ourselves sometimes and just do the best we can. And the best that we can is often quite good enough. It's a great perspective. It's so true really just try to enjoy the moment, be grateful for, for what you have. There, there are links between hearing loss and social isolation, depression, and the more that you can help control the environment and have a seat at the table and be able to decide where the other seats are, or even say, you know what? I know me, I need a break. I'm going to go for a walk. Fresh air sounds great. Bring one person with you or just know your limits, but get out there. Don't stay home by yourself, assuming you're not going to hear anything. No, absolutely not. We're very social and uh, hearing loss doesn't have to be the deterrent. Definitely. So what one thing do you, would you like if someone had one big takeaway from this podcast, what would you want them to, to know? I would love for them to know that it is possible to live well with your hearing loss. Even if you started from a position where you feel like it was maybe the worst thing that could happen to you and that you had not a lot of good role models but that you can do it. And I would really encourage them not to plug the book too much, but to take a look at the book. Gail and I really do feel like we've tried to lay out a thank you, Dawn, a way for anyone to do it. And it, it's not like you're going to snap your fingers and you're going to get there, but I feel like you will feel supported in reading the book. You will see parts of yourself in there and you will learn many tips and tricks that you can use in your life to live well. And we all deserve to live well with our hearing loss. And I think we can all do it. I agree. This is very well written. It's very thought out. And I'm going to try to give this to all of my patients as they're fit with their new hearing aids, because 
as an audiologist, as a clinician, there's a lot that I know that I've learned along the way, but I'm not living with a hearing loss. And so this book is filled with true, tried and true techniques. And, and they're not pretending to be perfect. Like Sherry said, they're like, oh, we're human. But it's a great start. A lot of interesting scenarios and conversations that you don't think about dating and stuff like that. It's all good, all good. So make sure you pick up a book. I am not an affiliate. I just love the book. <laughs> and I, I, when I heard that Sherry was uh, and Gail were writing, and I'm like, you have to be on the podcast for sure. I really appreciate all that you've done, Sherry, especially with your blogging and um, the way that you're advocating for the um, community. It's amazing. You, uh, I'm so glad that I got to meet you a few years ago. And I, I just have to say, keep doing great things because you're changing the world. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate it. And you too, you're changing the world too. So thank you for everything that you're doing. Absolutely. Thank you. Down below on our, on our, if you're watching on YouTube or if you're on our actual website, if you wanted to reach out to Sherry, there will be different ways and links that you can contact her. If you have any questions, we'll also have the link to the, the book of where you can purchase it. Okay. That sounds great. Thank you, Dawn. Thank you, Sherry. Have a wonderful day. And everyone who's listening, have a wonderful day as well. Bye. Bye. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Hearing Wellness Journey podcast. For more information about what we do and the services we provide, please visit our website at hearingwellnessjourney.com slash podcast, where you can find more resources based on today's discussion, as well as request to be a member of our Hearing Wellness Journey community on Facebook. That's available for our listeners exclusively on hearingwellnessjourney.com forward slash podcast.